Our dear viewers and listeners, we greet you all in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We this is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to today's Bible study. And we ask you to invite somebody to join you. Let's begin today's session with the word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you yes, for your grace, your love, and your mercy. Yes, the entrance of your word gives light and understanding to the simple. Yes, Lord. Here we are, Lord. Yes. Speak to us. Mm -hmm. Minister through us. Mm -hmm. Glorify Jesus. Yes, Lord. Open our eyes mm -hmm. to see the wonders of your grace, yes, Lord. of your power, mm -hmm. and of your wisdom. Yes. To the praise and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 We take today's reading to from the book of Romans, chapter 1, from verse 14 to verse 16. And this is what the Bible says. Paul writes to the church in Rome and he says, I am a data both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So, as much as is within me, you're I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation. To everyone who believes. For the Jew first. And also for the Greek. Bless the Lord for his word. Looking at this text, we see Paul making a very personal appeal. He is speaking to the congregation in Rome. And he uses the word I am. Cons consistently for three verses. In verse 14, he says, I am a data. In verse 15, he says, I am ready to preach. And in verse 16, he says, I am not ashamed. Here we have the attitude that defines a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. One who feels that he is a data. One who is ready to preach the gospel. And one who is not ashamed of the gospel. You see, to every believer in Jesus Christ, a sacred stewardship is entrusted to us within the ambit of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is therefore imperative to every one of us that we wisely invest what we have been entrusted with in the lives of people. So we are called upon to live this gospel but to also proclaim this gospel unto all the ends of the earth. I recall the words of the late Dr. T.L. Osborne. He said, Jesus Christ was not crucified in a cathedral between two candlesticks. Rather, he was crucified on a hill between two robbers. That is where the gospel must be taken. 
residual. That now. is where the gospel must be preached. We have a mandate to take the message of salvation and proclaim it to a perishing world so that sinners may come to the personal knowledge of Jesus Christ. And every one of us, we stand before our Lord on the last day to give an account of what we did with the gospel. We will not be asked what our pastors did. You will not be asked what your elders did. But everyone individually will have to answer to the Lord of how we invested the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it is not enough to quote the Bible. It is not enough to study it and write notes about it. It is not enough just to be articulate of what the gospel is. This gospel must be invested. And what is the attitude that we need to have? If we are to invest this gospel, Paul gives us the attitude of the I am. He says, I am. I am indebted. I am ready. I am not ashamed. He is not focusing on the I am not. You see, many times in life, we fail to fulfill our God-given mandate because we focus on what we are not. And we come up with excuses of why we cannot accomplish what was destined for us to accomplish. Because we are intent on what we are not. We are intent on what we don't have. We begin to say, if I only had this. You see, God will not hold us accountable for what we don't have. But what is it that you have? That is what God wants you to use to be able to achieve, to be able to accomplish what he has set you on earth to accomplish. So it is not what you don't have. It is what you already have. It is not what you are not. It is who you are right now. That is what you need to make a difference in life. And here Paul paints the picture for us. He gives us the three things. The three I am. That we need to be effective ministers of the gospel. Number one in verse 14. He says I am indebted. Num, verse 15 he says I am ready verse 16 he says I am not ashamed let's begin with the first one let's paint the I am when he says I am it is not saying I was it is not the past that will, you will leverage on to get to where God wants you to go he's not saying I will be it is not the future it is the present now that he is concerned with and Paul begins by saying, I am indebted both to the Greeks and the barbarians. Both to the wise and to the foolish. So what is he trying to 
help us understand here that in the present now every day becomes the present why is it the present because every day is God's present to every one of us and how we use it shows our appreciation for the present that God has given us so every day of our lives 24 hours a day 7 days a week 364 and a quarter days a year we are indebted Paul says I am a data the Greek word for data is the word of now this carries the of the inclination of, of financial obligation. If you are obligated to someone, if you are a data to someone, then you have an obligation to pay. Now you may ask me, but how can I be a data? If I have received this gospel this salvation by grace it is a free gift Paul tells us for by grace you have been saved through faith Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 in Romans chapter 3 and verse 24 he says being justified as a gift of his, by his grace so the question or the confusion for many people is how can I be a data when I have received this by grace? You see, this is the way it paints. This is the way it pans out. When, and I'll give you two examples where it comes for somebody to be in debt. You see, for example, if I have one million and I give this one million to Pastor Nathan, so as long as that one million is in Pastor Nathan's pocket. He is indebted. He is obligated to bring back that one million to me. So he's in debt. That is the one way. But the second way some can be in debt is where I get the one million and give it to Pastor Nathan and tell Pastor Nathan when he meet so and so give him that one million or give her that one million this is what happens as long as that one million is with Pastor Nathan he's in debt not only to me who has given it to him it becomes a two-way debt he's in debt because he has to pass it on to the person I asked him to pass it on to and until he has discharged that obligation he still remains in date now the, with the gospel that we have received with the salvation we have received we become datas in a two-way 
approach. So God has made us recipients of this free salvation. But he has charged us or failed us to give it to others. To share this gospel with unbelievers. When we share the gospel with the unbelievers, then we discharge this date. So in order to remove this obligation, we have to transfer this gospel and take it to others. As long as we withhold the gospel from somebody you are working with, from someone you are attending school with, from a member of your family, from someone God gives you an opportunity to sit next to, you are in date to God with a heightened sense of accountability. And on the last day, you will give an account. For so it will be revealed how every one of us invested the gospel into the lives of others. So the question, did you hold it to yourself? How did you share the gospel with others? This paints the picture that we see in Ezekiel 33. Where Ezekiel is raised as a watchman for his generation. You see, when a watchman sees an enemy coming, he was to warn them by blowing a trumpet. Now, if the people did not respond, this is what God told Ezekiel. And the enemy came and destroyed them. Then their blood would be on their own hands. That is to say, if they turn the deaf ear to every warning. But God told him that if the watchman sees the enemy coming and he chooses not to blow the trumpet and the people are destroyed, then their blood is on his hands. If we draw the analogy from here, we need then to understand that no matter how difficult no matter how unpleasant, the truth of the gospel must be proclaimed. Regardless of how unpopular it is, no matter how uncomfortable it would make people feel, we must be faithful mouthpieces of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because we have an obligation to discharge. The Apostle Paul, Paul at the end of his missionary journey, when he was leaving the church in Ephesus, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, from verse 18 to 21, he gathers them and passes on this message. He says, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived with you serving the Lord with all humility with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews 
and how I kept nothing back that was profitable to you but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks repentance towards God faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ and in his final farewell in verse 26 he would go on to tell them therefore I testify to you that I am innocent of the blood of all men that was his testimony concerning the church in Ephesus the same obligation is binding to you and I just like the watchman on the wall we will give an account just like Paul we are under obligation to do something with the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to give it as the opportunity divinely arrives to both Greeks and to barbarians. What is he trying to say here? Here Paul is dividing everything to classes. In one group he had the Greeks. The Greeks were the top of the society. They were the cultured people. They were the educated. They were those that were trained in the social graces. They were those that were articulate. They were the philosophers of the time. There were those that were learned in the subjects of society. Paul believed that he must preach the gospel to those that were of the highest of society. But also, he had an obligation to the barbarians. Now, the barbarians were the total antithesis of the Greeks. So when the Greeks were the top of the ladder, Barbarians were the bottom of the ladder. They were, their pronunciations were not articulate. As a matter of the fact, the word barbarian was derogatory. It was the word that mocked them because they did not speak with elegance. So when they began to talk, the Greeks say they uttered words like ba, 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 ba. so they called them the barbarians but Paul said both to the Greeks and to the barbarians I am indebted both to the wise and to the foolish I am indebted in other words, those who felt wise in their own eyes, those who excel to the highest levels, those who were educated in the philosophies and the ideologies of the world system, he felt indebted to them. You see, the cost and that also happened to those of the lowest society. Those that were considered unwise. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not to a particular class of people. I've had a lot of people say, no, our church was called to the affluent of society. No, the gospel is for everyone. 
Tulia wamba gamba se Tua iti wakumuli ya wangaka Enjini msibu eche Ya iti wakumuli ya buliomu We are to take the whole counsel of God Tulia kutuwa lo kutesa kwa katona And declare it To kumuli to every one of them Buliomu Paul says I am under obligation Bawla gamba Chinundeke dotikula I am indebted Manjibwa He say I've met some Christians who say But this is a Christian You know when we come to Christ This whole thing of being indebted Is legalistic You are putting me under the law I'm free to live everywhere that I want to live I can do everything that I want to do That's not so When you come to Christ You surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ You are free, yes But your freedom Is best exercised Under the Lordship of Jesus Christ And that you must put to to know it because you will be accountable for how you lived your life Paul then goes on to say I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also I like how he begins it he says so as much as is in me in other words as much as I have according to how much has been entrusted to me according to what is available to me I am ready I am eager the word ready is the Greek word prosumos prosumos Prothumos is a very interesting word. It is a word that we get from athletics. I want you to paint the picture of an athlete. Leaning forward. Pressing to run. That act of leaning forward. As they are getting set to run. As you said, get on your mask, get set. That leaning forward to make that sprint is where we get the prosumos. So, thumos is that readiness. Now, the pro that adds to it is what adds that prefix. That intensifies the thumos. So you are at a gate set. If it were a gun, your hand is on the trigger. Paul is saying, I am ready to go. Again, I will draw another analogy of a horse race. And the horses are ready to go. They are gated. The rider is holding on to the reins. And they are breathing hard. Waiting to make that first kick out of the blocks. That is where you get the profumos from. And Paul is saying, I am not only obligated, but I am ready. You see, it is one thing to be in debt. Very few people in debt are eager to pay. 
But but I don't know about but I don't know about but I don't know but I I am ready to go out. to do? What is he ready to do? He says to preach the gospel. So he's not only living it, but he's also ready to preach it. To preach the gospel. That is one Greek word. It is the word euangelism. You angelizo, you angelizo is the word from which we get the three words to preach the good news. So Paul is saying, I'm ready to preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to you who are in Rome also. Now I want you to understand where this is coming from. Paul is eager to take this news to an area of the world he has never been to. This was the capital of the greatest empire of his time. Every crime was in there. This was the hardest place to preach at that time on earth. It is not one place that you would be so eager to go to. But Paul says, I am eager I am ready to go even to Rome and preach this gospel. You see, to many of us, we have our rooms. These are maybe your family. This may be the place where you work. This may be your school where you study. This is the place where everybody knows everything about you. Are you ready to preach the gospel there? What is your room? <laughs> what is that you consider that hard place to witness? To? Are they family members? Is it a place of work? That is where you need to take the gospel. Paul says, I am indebted. But I am not only indebted. I am also ready. Why is he ready to take the gospel? He answers that because I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. He uses a negative word. Shame is a negative word. And then he adds not. In other words, he gets two negative words. I am not ashamed. To drive the point home. Why is he not ashamed of the gospel? You see, for many of us, the reason why we don't preach the gospel because we think it is not in sync with the times. And therefore we are afraid of speaking out. Paul tells us why we should not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. The word power there is the word dunamis, where we get the word dynamite, which we get explosive. What is Paul saying? The gospel has supernatural power to liberate unbelievers from 
the bondage of sin. It does not matter how sinful a person is. It does not matter what their lifestyle is. How far they have fallen. It doesn't matter whether they are Greek. It doesn't matter whether they are barbarian. It doesn't matter whether they are wise or foolish. It doesn't matter who you are or who they are. The power of the gospel is far more powerful than the power of sin. Let me say it again. The power of the gospel is far more powerful than the power of sin. The power of the gospel the gospel is able to make a life change an eternity altering change in the life of any person that believes no message makes a deeper effect upon a person's life than the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ no message has the power to change people inside out than the power of the gospel the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a mere simple behavior modification it is not something that changes us outwardly and leaves us as we are inside. The gospel has divine power to revolutionize any life to the extent that we are no longer the same. Again, Paul writes in another portion of scripture in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 and says therefore if any man is in Christ he is a new creation all, all things have passed away behold all things have become new the gospel is able to bring a transformation no one receives the gospel and is not dramatically impacted by it. When you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are radically transformed at the deepest level of your being. The gospel is not just the painting of the exterior of your life. The gospel is a total reconstruction process. All the old practices of sin are torn down. And new patterns come in place. You are totally wired. You are totally restructured. You have a new mind. You have a new heart. You get a new will. You have a new disposition and more importantly you have a new standing with God your priorities become new your pursuits in life become new the direction of your life is new and most importantly your destiny is changed forever why? Because the gospel has power. Believing in Jesus Christ is not just checking the box. I know. Believing in Jesus Christ is transformation. 
Your life changes inside out. You see, I've met a lot of people who say, I, I, I've not had this dramatic change. And the question I ask them, what is your salvation experience? So you mean salvation is an experience? Yes. Yeah. It is an experience. You get to have an affirmation that I am no longer who I was. My life has been changed. The gospel explodes in a believer's life. The way a volcano erupts, you cannot be the same again. Whoever believes in Jesus Christ, you are changed forever. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. It is not human power. It is God's power. God's explosive power in the life of a believer. The same power that exploded in him on his way to Damascus when he went to get Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem. That power that got off him off his high horse and transformed Paul of Tarsus into Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ. It is that power that captures every individual and brings them to salvation. Now, the word salvation is an exciting word. The Greek word for that is the word soteria, which means deliverance from danger or being rescued from ruin. You see, I get to have people saying, saved from what? You are saved from danger. So what is that danger that you are saved from? Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 1 verse 18. He says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. But you get rescued from when you become saved. Is the wrath of God that is addressed to all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. You see, many people say, you know what? Sinners smile. God loves you. He has a wonderful plan for you. But I want to tell you something. If you refuse Christ, Christ, and I will quote the words of Evangelist Jonathan Edwards. That all without Christ are sinners in the hands of an angry God. Without Christ, what you have is the wrath of God. To be saved by God through Jesus Christ means to be saved from his wrath. This is salvation is not you being saved from your personal insecurities. <laughs> yes, those insecurities will disappear. But salvation is being restored from the wrath of God. And only the power of God can rescue you from the wrath of God. The only one who can rescue you 
on the wrath of God is God himself. And how is that possible? Through the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, failure to that happen, you are in the house of the God of wrath. And the right of Hebrews tells us in chapter 10 and verse 31, he says it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. So if you are there, you have never received Jesus Christ. Christ. There is only one way. That way is a person. His name is Jesus Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The only way to be saved from God's wrath is through the gospel of His grace. And that is through the person of Jesus Christ. Paul then adds in the gospel and says to everyone who believes, to everyone who believes, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you came from, it doesn't matter how far you have fallen into sin. Are you in the class of everyone? Do you believe? Then salvation has come to you. Everyone who believes, the word you believe is the word pisteo, which means to commit one's life. And in this context, it is to commit your life to Jesus Christ alone as Lord and Savior. It means to trust Him exclusively. To rely on Him completely. For you to have a right standing with God. It means to have faith in Him, no longer trusting in your own needs. But looking to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ alone. For Paul tells us that the righteousness of God has been made manifest through faith in Jesus Christ. For all those who believe, Romans 3 21 to 22, we need to maintain this that we are justified by faith apart from works of the we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. And he says this goes to the Jew first. And to the Greek. Why to the Jew first? Because Jesus tells us in John chapter 4 and verse 22 that salvation is of the Jews. The message of salvation was first preached to the Jews. But listen to this. The same message that saves the Jews is the same message that saves the Greek. There is no one except Jesus. Salvation is not through any other. Salvation is through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. There is no other way a Jew can be saved that is different from the way a Greek can be saved. It is all through the narrow gate. And the narrow gate is Jesus Christ who leads us to the kingdom. Listen to me. This gospel has the power to change 
The gospel is God's own power. So why are we missing it today? The reason we are missing it, we forget how powerful the gospel is. We forget how much power it has. Sometimes we think that the power is in our presentation of the message. But that is so far from the truth. The gospel itself has the inherent power to save. I said, no, the, the preacher it does not have to be the preacher. God throughout history has worked through weak people to spread the gospel. The gospel itself is the power. When it is accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit, it will explode in the life of anyone that believes. Jesus preached and said, the flesh profiteth nothing. It is the spirit that gives life. And he says, the words that I speak, they are spirit and their life. That power to bring life to dead situations lies in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what you and I have to do is not to make the gospel more powerful. Because there is nothing we do that makes it more powerful. What we have to do is to present the gospel as God gives us the utterance, as God gives us the opportunity and then allow God to to unleash in the souls and the hearts of men the power to transform them. The gospel is a supernatural message. It has the supernatural power. It has the soul-saving power. It has the power that only God can give. And it will take men and women who are indebted to preach this gospel. Who are ready to preach this gospel. And who are not ashamed to preach this gospel. Does that define you? Let's pray. Father, stuff it. We give you praise. We give you thanks for the gift of life. We give you thanks for the gospel. Because it is the power of God. And to salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first and to the Greek. Lord, we have not been faithful. Lord, we have not embarked on this journey to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. We have ordered it. We have not spread it. We ask your forgiveness. And today, as the word has come to us, Lord, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you will set us on fire. Set us ablaze, Lord, to take this gospel to other parts of the earth. Rekindle a burden of indebtedness in every one of us. Prepare us, Lord, with the readiness to carry this gospel of peace. Lord, may it be our attitude that we will never be ashamed of this gospel and we will take it fearless 
But the prayer that we can hear and use every opportunity available to us to speak your truth to the glory and the praise of your name in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you and we bless you. Amen. Now, for you who has never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. What you need in life, what you need for godliness, is Jesus Christ. And today, you can invite him in your life. And the explosive power that saves you from the danger of God's wrath will flood your hearts, will flood your mind, will cause a complete transformation of your life. Just say, God of heaven and earth, I am a sinner. I need a savior in my life. Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you are the savior of the world. And you are my savior. Today, Lord, come into my heart. Be the savior. Be the Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Amen. If you have said that prayer, by faith, you have been saved. And Spirit of the Lord, flood that heart. Fill the Spirit of the Lord, fill that heart. Spirit of the Lord, mold that life. I thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. From Dominion Church. It's been a pleasure to have you today. Thank you for taking time off to fellowship with us. Till we meet again, we say God richly bless you. Shalom.